So can you please tell us about your research that has investigated diet change or consumer behaviors? Sure. So the goal of this research was to provide a more holistic and action guiding picture of Chinese consumers and perceptions towards plant-based meat. Um, the reason why we wanted to do this was because we saw that the current research um, about the plant-based market is usually very survey-based. So you get a broad sense of uh, what the, the population might be thinking, but you don't actually get an idea of who the individual consumers and the types of different consumers are, which might be very difficult to act upon for advocates and also um, other plant-based stakeholders like startups and, and marketers within those uh, companies. So um, in order to do this, we ran a mixed method study. Um, we started off uh, on the qualitative side uh, with 10 focus groups and a series of food diaries to understand what consumers were eating and um, also like what were motivating their decisions in terms of food consumption and purchases. And then based on the insights that we gathered here, we identified five customer personas, which you can see on the slide, um, and saw that they had different um, drivers, motivations, and barriers when they were looking at their food consumption. And then from these findings, we designed and distributed a survey to over 1,200 respondents um, to roughly represent the, the Chinese population. And we found that 84% of respondents um, identified with at least one of these five personas. Uh, we thought that the social foodie was the most promising segment for plant-based meat. Um, and then that's followed closely by nutritional optimizers. Um, while the vegans and vegetarians actually represent a very small percentage of the population and may not be um, the most sort of exciting targets for the market. My research focuses on how people experience and cope with cognitive conflicts. So a lot of research has been done on uh, cognitive dissonance, and I investigate how people cope with ambivalence, so whether people's attitudes are conflicted. So um, I built on the trends theoretical model, and um, there are five stages in this model. Um, so the first one is the pre-contemplation stage, um, in which omnivores can be. And here, uh, people hold positive associations, uh, a lot of them, and uh, rarely negative associations, as I show in my research. And thus, the ambivalence um, is low, which you can see here in black, and people eat a lot of meat. Um, so um, this mostly contains of uh, people who uh, argue that meat consumption is normal, natural, nice, or necessary. Um, however, people can um, get attitude inconsistent information and um, yeah, feel more negative about meat. Um, and these negative associations can lead to more ambivalence. And this is associated in my research with less ambivalence. And um, this can even go further that people are actually holding uh, a similar amount of positive and negative associations. And um, yeah, then they eat less meat and might even prepare to change their diets. Um, what's new in my model, I think this is fairly, um, yeah, fairly well researched, um, is that vegans, so vegetarians and vegans can also experience conflict. Um, this is because um, I assume in my model that people tag their past attitudes, so their positive associations towards meat as false. And um, these past attitudes still exist though. Um, so, um, their past attitudes can become accessible in um, s uh, several situations. For example, imagine being in a family dinner and um, having like the traditionally cooked dish. So you won't belong and you won't have the good taste. And in this situation, you have to convince yourself that meat consumption is actually bad. So um, yeah, you can fail to do so. And uh, thus people in the action stage, so uh, fairly early after adopting a um, new diet will eat a little more meat, um, probably because they um, experience more ambivalence. However, uh, the longer you uh, adhere to your diet, uh, the more automatically you can reject your diet due to um, yeah, a better accessibility of this false tech and then ambivalence falls off and you probably um, adhere stricter to your diet. Well, I love uh, Benjamin's work there, um, partly because I'm 
using the same uh, model in this instance. So um, I've also looked at uh, meat reduction and uh, giving up meat through the trans theoretical model, the stages of change um, from pre-contemplation through contemplation, preparation, and then onto action and maintenance of uh, vegetarianism or veganism. Um, and in particular, I've looked at the different uh, psychological and social uh, biases which can affect uh, people at each of those stages. Um, one of the things that I like about this model is that it enables you to see that uh, an individual can make progress without having gone vegetarian yet. So from an advocate's perspective, you might feel frustrated that somebody that you're speaking to um, doesn't go vegetarian straight away. Uh, but when you look at this through the stages of change, you can see that somebody could move from pre-contemplation to contemplation or preparation, um, and they're kind of more in the direction of going vegetarian, even if they haven't made the change yet. Um, so just by bringing the topic up, somebody who's in pre-contemplation stage, they can move on to the contemplation stage, and that is already a form of progress, even if they haven't stopped eating meat yet. So as you can see, um, the paper, which is referenced here at the bottom, um, has a bunch of different uh, biases and impacts that, uh, or effects that it looks at at the different stages. And most of these are in the contemplation stage where people are really first thinking about whether they ought to be eating meat or not. And all of these different, um, all of these different effects come into play. So one of the major things driving uh, cognition at this stage is cognitive dissonance and motivated reasoning. So uh, essentially people really like eating meat. They don't want to stop doing that. Um, and so they're starting from there and then kind of working backwards to make up their reasons why they think that's going to be okay. Um, and this means that you can get a lot of interesting beliefs that people seem that they wouldn't be holding if it wasn't in the context of a conversation about going vegetarian. Thank you. So my research group has mostly investigated the effectiveness of um, educational appeals that try to reduce consumption of meat or animal products. And so the first thing we did was a meta-analysis where we essentially collected and synthesized a uh, hundred existing studies that made appeals specifically to animal welfare. Um, and we found uh, promisingly that the interventions were actually consistently associated with reduced consumption, as we might hope. Um, we did also find that there were relatively widespread uh, methodological limitations in this literature. And so, for example, uh, many studies asked about people's intentions to reduce consumption rather than their actual consumption. Um, also, many studies measured outcomes immediately after the intervention rather than after some delay. So it's hard to tell how long the effects would last. Um, additionally, uh, it, it was often hard to tell whether there could be social desirability bias, meaning it could be that participants were um, aware of the purpose of the study when they responded, um, and that can affect responses as well, especially when those responses are uh, self-reported or intention measures. And so to try to address some of these limitations, uh, we recently did a randomized trial to look at a professionally produced documentary. This was a collaboration with the Humane League. And we tried to introduce a number of methodological innovations to try to minimize some of these issues that, that are um, uh, commonplace in a lot of previous studies. And so, for example, when we asked participants about their meat consumption, we did that 12 days after they watched the documentary. Um, and we described that follow-up study as something unrelated so that participants weren't actually aware that we were trying to reduce uh, meat consumption. Uh, this basically helped to sort of blind the participants to the purpose of the study. The results were, were pretty interesting and I think serve as an important cautionary tale. Um, with the stronger study design, we actually found that the documentary was completely ineffective. Um, this is only one intervention. There are many other possible ones out there. Um, but uh, it's interesting to note that when we then redesigned the study to more closely resemble existing ones um, by asking viewers what they intended to do, 
uh, then the documentary suddenly looked really effective. And so, again, an important cautionary tale that you can get a seemingly impressive intervention effect uh, purely as artifacts of methodological issues. We were interested in the most effective way to ask consumers to reduce their meat consumption. So there's some debate in the field over whether or not it's more effective to ask consumers to completely eliminate meat from their diet, so to go vegetarian, or just to reduce their consumption. So while individuals who go vegetarian are, of course, saving more meat than those who just reduce their consumption, fewer people will agree to it. So it's unclear which is effect more effective on the whole. So we were interested in drilling in, down into that a little bit more and investigating by what amount advocates should be asking people to reduce their meat consumption. So similar to the vegetarian example, while people who agree to larger requests are cutting their consumption more, fewer people will agree to it. So we were interested in identifying basically the tipping point and finding the reduction request that maximizes the amount of meat meals saved. So we ran two studies in four countries, the Netherlands, Australia, Britain, and America. We asked them how many meals they eat containing meat in the average week, and then asked them whether they'd be willing to reduce their meat consumption by a series of amounts from 10% to 100%. Uh, for each request that an individual agreed to, we multiplied their number of weekly meat meals by that reduction amount, and that gave us the amount of meat meals that were saved per week by them agreeing to that request. Uh, we then compared across all the different request amounts to identify which reduction request led to the greatest reduction in meat across the whole sample. What recommendations would you make for advocates based on your findings? I think the overall recommendation is to test your assumptions about uh, your target audience. So I think we had several findings that were surprising to us. Um, first of all, um, the concept of health is often thrown around as something that would be appealing to Chinese consumers, but we learned that this is actually a very nuanced concept. It might be related to um, food safety, which then also breaks in, down into different concepts. Um, and those might speak to different types of consumers. Um, and so in order to uh, effectively target and um, activate uh, like, or engage those consumers, we need to understand the nuanced concepts that are uh, driving their behaviors. Uh, another thing that seemed to be a barrier to adoption were different nutritional myths, um, like certain animal products being necessary for growth um, or other negative perceptions towards plant-based meat, like it being too processed. And if we want widespread adoption, it seems like we would really need to address some of uh, these issues. I think um, finally, probably the main takeaway message is about uh, consumers not being kind of one um, or an average of different uh, features, uh, but actually there are specific types um, they have certain demographics, um, certain uh, behaviors, certain beliefs, uh, which you can we would try to pre uh, represent in the consumer personas. So you can see one here. Um, and based on these specific characteristics, we can target products, marketing, um, figure out where we might be placing products, what channels to speak to them through, uh, who or what influencers might be most effective. And ultimately, it's it's really about like understanding who the target audience is and uh, customizing our strategies based on what we know about them. So far, the research on cognitive conflicts um, mostly concerned omnivores, as I said, and I think this is reasonable because like um, animal welfare activists want to change people's diets. However, um, it's also important that people stick to their diets. And um, I think cognitive conflicts for vegetarians and vegans are also quite important. And um, our model suggests that there's also a certain time range. I think the action stage um, mostly um, is six up to six months after people adopted their new found diet. And then this um, uh, time frame, I would assume that people are most prone to um, yeah, falling back to an omnivore uh, diet or um, even um, 
eating meat from sun, uh, from time to time. And um, yeah, we outline why this might be the case. And um, here it is just really important for people not to, um, yeah, fall back. Um, it's easier said than done. Um, but um, I think people should avoid some situations probably um, just crossing the street probably when they uh, go near a burger place or something like that, uh, when they taste the familiar uh, and positive um, meat, um, which is then uh, might lead them to fall back. I think this is one thing that can be uh, said from our research. And I think this is backed up by studies showing that uh, I think 34% of uh, people who adopt a vegetarian diet fall back within the first three months um, and revert to an omnivore diet. So yeah, I think this is one implication and the other implications I think, um, yeah, might concern how uh, we can even foster, foster this approach. And I think here discussed, for example, this is in some other research I do, uh, might play a pivotal role uh, because if we associate some moral issues with it that come mostly from animal um, ethics issues, um, then yeah, people might recruit disgust and uh, yeah, find meat less appetizing and then there are less positive associations towards meat and uh, this might also foster. So um, yeah, I think animal uh, welfare activists should be aware of that. Um, vegans might still have conflicts and then they might try to foster disgust and um, recommend them to um, avoid situations in which positive associations can become accessible. Agree with what Benjamin said about that. Um, and I've actually done some follow up empirical work on this framework, which, um, yeah, supports the uh, view that people who are earlier in the transition to vegetarianism are more likely to relapse than, than people who have been at it for a longer time. Um, I think that one thing we can take when looking at the stages of change model is that different uh, interventions are going to be relevant for people at different stages. So for people at the pre-contemplation stage, um, you know, these are people who have never thought about giving up meat. And so simply putting the reasons for doing that in front of them, um, you know, images of animal cruelty is going to be a sort of consciousness raising experience and, and will get them to moving on to the contemplation stage. Whereas other people who are at the action stage, for example, or in the first few months of their transition, that might be helpful as well to remind them of the reasons for doing that, but also there might be other things like bringing them into vegetarian communities and giving that level of social support so that they're less likely to revert to eating meat as well. So looking at people at different stages of the transition and then using different kinds of interventions for those people. And again, just thinking about it as a process. So don't get frustrated basically if somebody doesn't go vegetarian straight away and know that they can have made progress even just by thinking about it. First of all, um, I'm thrilled just to see so much empirical research being done by animal advocates um, in recent years. This is a really super promising trend. Um, we had no idea at the outset when we did the meta-analysis that we would find 100 studies on, on such a narrow topic um, uh, in terms of a type of educational appeal. As I said, I think this does provide quite promising preliminary evidence um, to support these educational efforts. but. I do think that moving forward, it's it's really time for our field to um, try to reassess some of these interventions in increasingly rigorous designs. I think the time has come to really uh, try to move to actionable insights um, in terms of really strongly evidenced interventions. Um, and so on the left-hand panel of the slide are some key things to keep in mind when trying to design intervention studies. Um, just to kind of briefly summarize some of these, one is that we really want to have a good control group um, to which to compare our intervention. Um, ideally, we want to actually randomly assign people to an intervention versus some control condition. And so as one sort of thought experiment of a common study design that is not so strong in this regard, uh, say I set up like a booth on a college campus and I ask um, passersby if they want to take a pledge to reduce their meat consumption. I survey them about their consumption that day and again two weeks later. And I compare to see um, to what extent people reduce their consumption. 
Uh, the issue with that design is that it doesn't have a control group, right? And so it could be that people reduce their consumption just because they were going to anyway, regardless of the pledge. That's perhaps why they agreed to be in the study in the first place. And so that's a design that's not, not very good in terms of comparable group. We also want to try to minimize social desirability bias. Um, one of the best ways to do this is to have subjects be relatively unaware of the purpose of the study. Um, so to illustrate how this could go wrong, suppose I did another type of study. Again, I have my booths on the college campus. Uh, I ask passersby if they want to read a newspaper article, for example. This time I randomly assign them. Uh, some participants are uh, will be asked to read a newspaper article about reducing meat consumption. Others will uh, read a newspaper article about something unrelated. Uh, again, I survey them a few weeks later and I say, thanks for doing the study about the newspaper articles. Um, now we'd like to ask you some questions about your meat consumption. So better in terms of more comparable groups, um, but we do have a problem here potentially where uh, individuals who read the, the meat consumption article might feel more um, social pressure to, let's say, underreport their meat consumption um, on follow-up rather than participants who read an unrelated article. So we want to try to ideally have participants not know what we're trying to do in the study. We also want to try to use outcome measures that are ideally direct behavioral measures, um, things like uh, sales of meat in a cafeteria rather than merely self-report or um, even worse, just asking people about their intentions. Uh, we want to try to have a reasonable length of follow-up between the intervention and assessment of consumption so that we have some sense of how long the effects actually last. And last, I think something this field is already doing really well is, um, is trying to have results be reproducible. So making data and code available, ideally pre-registering study protocols as well when possible. The um, found that mid-range requests led to the greatest reduction in meat consumption. So, for example, in study two, asking people to reduce their consumption by 50% uh, saved an average of about 2.36 meat meals per week. Um, as we expected, people were more likely to agree to the smaller requests, but they in turn led to a smaller reduction in meat. So, for example, about 10%. Sorry, um, most of the people in our sample agreed to reduce their consumption by about 10%, but this only led to a reduction of less than one meat meal per week on average. Um, on the contrary, people were less likely to agree to a larger request. So only about 25% of people would agree to go vegetarian, so to cut their meat consumption entirely. Um, so this led to a reduction of just under two meat meals per week on average. So while this is just um, a first initial study on the topic and much more work is needed, we think this suggests that when advocates are asking consumers to limit their consumption, they should be focusing on those mid-range requests. So we found about 40 to 70% was about the sweet spot. Um, so asking for too small of a reduction may lead to higher rates of agreement, but won't make that much of an actual reduction. Whereas asking consumers to go vegetarian is um, going to have lower rates of agreement. Uh, also, while we didn't investigate it in this study, our findings might also suggest that targeted, targeted interventions may be more effective. So we found consistent differences among who was agreeing to the different requests and maps. So in particular, people who currently consume higher levels of meat were less likely to agree to larger request amounts. Um, this might suggest that advocates should consider targeted approaches for different populations. So, for example, when asking people who currently eat meat in every single meal to reduce their consumption, it might be more effective to ask for a smaller reduction, say like 10 to 30 percent. But if you're approaching a group who eat meat uh, more infrequently, they may be more receptive to a larger reduction request. Um, but that said, our results do show that at the population level, the mid-range requests, so again, the 40 to 70%, um, were the most effective and led to the greatest reduction in meat overall.